It might be said, in the end, that portal chess is just another variant of chess. But then, too, we could call an iPod just another variant of a transistor radio. But is that truly descriptive? Portals represent a new type of chess piece, and I, as I have explored the properties of portals, I have taken to naming the properties of all chess pieces. One does not need to understand the properties of pieces if there is but one variant of a game. But as one begins to see the possibility of a constellation of games, variants within variances, it becomes difficult to talk intelligently about these things without beginning the naming process. For example, a chess piece can block your move. That is trivially true of all chess pieces on the board, including a standard portal. But in terms of portal theory, this is but one possibility for a portal. The idea that a portal could be a pass-through or optional is compelling. Thus, we realize that there is a constellation of game possibilities, and as we decide one type over the other, for reasons I will go into later, I think it is important to take note of other options, and I hope I can make clear why it is so. Portal chess at one time meant standard portal chess to me, but I, I began to realize that I would rather portal chess stand for all variants of portal chess. Greedy, I know, but I felt it would also add in people's describing their variants of portal chess. So my original game, I now simply refer to as standard portal chess. Thus, my intent for portal chess is to be a generic, descriptive term for all variants of portal chess. Standard portal chess is my portal chess primer. It teaches the basic concepts of portals and forces you to use them in a game. Once you have a feel for standard portals, you can begin to start to think about more advanced concepts in the portal chess universe. Game theory does not help in game design, because game design needs to consider the fun factor. Chess is considered a complex game, and as such, its appeal is limited, and is considered a mark of intelligence if you simply know how to play the game. Thus, complexity is the enemy of the fun factor. It is interesting to note that Einstein refused to play it because of its militaristic pedigree. But there are plenty of examples of other intellectuals losing themselves in the game of chess. Because chess is within the set of portal chess, portal chess is necessarily more complicated than chess alone. One goal I had with standard portal chess was to minimize the number of new rules that you would need to understand and to make the rules consistent within a simple paradigm. Thus, I came up with a one-line description of a standard portal. A standard portal is a dynamic, non-optional, attack-activated gateway to another portal that can be used by any piece on the board as a part of a normal attack move. Because a pawn has two types of moves, a passive move and an attack move, I decided to couple the attack characteristic of the pawn with the activation characteristic of the portal, giving the pawn its two diagonal attack moves as a method for traversing the portal chain. All other pieces have attack moves, so it is consistent. And because a portal is non-optional, a pawn cannot move onto a portal as a passive move, again consistent with a one-line description of the standard portal. The beauty of portal chess as an educational tool I don't think should be underestimated. It has certainly been educational to me. The ramifications of portals are fun to note. For example, what happens to bishops? Because bishops are color-coordinated, can a bishop have a religious conversion going through a portal? A pawn can only move in one direction. Does that mean that they have to always choose a forward portal? More often than not, less is more, and especially in design. Thus, in standard portal chess, bishops can have religious conversions, and pawns can end up on any square on the board. Although on the first rank, the pawn has to be on a portal. Do you know why? It's relatively trivial to add bishop color coordination and pawn forward movement rules, but what does it add to the game? How does it make it more fun? We are often passive players, not game designers. However, sometimes, because we don't remember the official rules, we make up our own, specifically in card games. And in an era when finding the official rules was difficult without the internet, this was better than having no rules at all, and sometimes became the preferred rules of a game. I think it's an important part of game evolution to allow for variations, 
and it should be encouraged in some ways. Interestingly, chess has been resistant to this. Variants of chess are seldom played by chess players, in large part because of the complexity of the strategies that are necessary to be a good chess player. To understand the mind of a chess player, we must first understand that rules are to strategy as gravity is to dance. We need rules so that we can develop our strategy. Changing the rules changes the strategies. Would we dance the same on the moon or on a space station? I think not, but I do hunger for the day that I will get to see these dances. Because of the deep strategy in chess, chess is not a trivial game, and ornamental changes are simply annoying. For people that do not know the rules of en pensant or castling, such rules, when first encountered, can result in exceptional frustration and utter disbelief, because they do not fall easily from the rest of the rules. In fact, they do not. They are strategically driven rules. Getting a castle out from behind the pawns without moving the king is complex, and so a hybrid move was developed to put the castle in play. The origins of the idea of castling are not known, but the reasons are clear for strategic flexibility. En pensant has strategic merit. However, en pensant is so convoluted that it may never be used in a game, and when it is exercised, shock has to result. It was derived because of the first move of the pawn, being able to pass an opposing pawn. Originally, before the 1500s, pawns were only able to move one square on their first move. From a designer's perspective, it is clear the rule was driven from committee, trying to make a compromise. As such, I have expelled it from standard portal chess as a design error. It is interesting that it has survived as long as it has. This is a testament to chess's religiosity, where reason often gives way to tradition. It is questionable to allow castling in standard portal chess, because a portal will facilitate the same type of move that a castle move does. Thus, as of this writing, it is still a part of standard portal chess, but I will not go far to defend its merits, because the only defense I have is one of tradition, and I think I have established my feelings about that. Portals are too rich in intellectual curiosity to be bogged down with the traditions of chess. Though I feel compelled to tip my hat to my ancestors, I will insist that I know better. I have a better view, do I not? I have taken note of the use of the word chess as a metaphoric tool, and I feel compelled to change the lexicon. If you laugh at my arrogance, I will be compelled to laugh with you. But I should not. The reality is, portals offer a means to explore a deeper set of strategic realities that chess is simply not suited for. It is my arrogant opinion that a more advanced version of chess will illustrate many of the modern principles that have emerged in the past century. Scalability as well as Nash's equilibrium are presented in advanced forms of portal chess. In some ways, we are intellectually stunted because we have not updated our metaphor for strategy, and truly we should. Nash's equilibrium should not be seen as in the abstract light of a beautiful mind of a mathematician, but should be as tangible model that we can easily be constructed from a few chess sets and some quarters. I often use quarters to illustrate portals, so much so that it is hard for me to look at a quarter without seeing the hue of portaldom. I did not set out in the fall of 1993 to invent a variant of chess. I was only trying to prove a point that rules can be changed. The current form of standard portal chess did not get invented until 2000, but I conceived of the portal in 1993 as a part of a monolithic variant of chess I called fantasy chess. Perhaps one day I will tell its story, but for now it remains sealed in a certified envelope, really. Games need to be fun, but more important than that, they need to be rewarding. Standard Portal Chess is a true successor to chess. It is a tournament class game that has all the look and feel of chess with the novelty and the change that portals bring. Because Standard Portal Chess fully embraces the core tradition of chess, it is trivial for a chess player to learn and be good at. However, Standard Portal Chess is for the tactical player and will harshly punish traditional positional play. 
because portals change the rule of, of position fundamentally. Standard portals allow for the possibility of regrouping because of the blocking characteristic of standard portals. Unheard of in traditional chess, this brings the possibility of drawing out play. Portals control is essential for keeping the possibility of drawn out play to a minimum. I suspect this is mainly a symptom of sloppy play, but it's something that concerns me. A link validator is available for download as well as the source code in live code. A few YouTube videos are also available for your consideration on YouTube linked within this video. I believe the long-term economic viability of Portal Chess depends on tournament play and on incentivizing good play through monetary rewards. Chess players need to be encouraged to make the switch and there's no better way to encourage the switch than to give incentives both recognition and a little something something. My Kickstarter concept would be to establish a live code open source platform for variants of Portal Chess and to pay tournament portals to encourage play and to establish a pecking order for the best players in the world.